Good evening. I'm Jerry Wayne. Everybody have a nice pandemic? Good. That shit was a lot of fun for me. I got the COVID blues. My full name is Jerry Wayne Longmire Jr. Soak it in. That's a mouthful of hillbilly, ain't it? I know. When I first got to Houston and started telling people my name, they'd walk the hell off before I was even done. Just, it was just me and my three Mexican friends and all our names, you know. That shit ain't funny, is it? Juan Diaz, Ortego, Villarreal the third. That's, that's horse shit. That's a, that's a hard name to live with, man. That's a big moniker, right? You know, I ain't gonna be president with a name like that. That'd be terrifying. Well, maybe not right now. Right now, everybody's like, yeah, we'll take it. Alzheimer guy or a hillbilly. <laughs> We've already had a lot of hillbillies run the country. We weren't terrible at it. Y'all voted that Yankee in that fucked everything up. <laughs> everybody's trying to figure out which one. <laughs> Is Hawaiian Yankee? I don't know. I don't know geography. <laughs> I know how y'all are. <laughs> and I got this voice, too, right? Like this, you know what this voice is good for? Selling steak sauce and brake pads. That's what. <laughs> Fingers crossed, I'm waiting on A1 to call me, but. Or AutoZone. The call ain't come in yet, you know? It's not, it's not exactly the voice of reassurance, is it? You know, depends on the context, right? You broke down on the side of the highway at 2 o'clock in the morning. A guy shows up, sounds like me, looks like me. You're like, oh, we're going to be all right, baby. We're going home. We're going home. Yeah, it don't matter where you're from. Everybody's got a cousin or an uncle that sounds like this. And you're like, no, it's cool. I got an uncle just like him fixed my radiator with a chicken egg and a paper clip one time. We're good. I got a friend. Uh, one of one of my one of my close friends. He is a a life light, and not just like a life light paramedic. He's like the guy that can like mix medicines on board stuff. He's really well educated, but he sounds like this, <laughs> and he's from Kentucky. And I just thought, how how terrible would that be? You know, say you get in some car wreck, right? And you hit a telephone pole, and you're laid out in the street, and your guts are spilled out. You're having a shitty day, you know? <laughs> Things aren't going according to plan. And you're thinking, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it right now. And you hear that angel of mercy in the distance. At <laughs> and you're like, oh, shit. Oh, Jesus. I may make it. And you hear that bird come in that it lands. And you're like, I'm gonna make it. And then you hear, Woo! I got you, baby, you're gonna be fine. Somebody wrench off that helicopter, get me them leeches. We got a hot belly. We got problems. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> they hated it at my last job. I was a licensed nuclear inspector and FAA aircraft inspector for like 19 years. Yeah. <laughs> I love that y'all just like, what? Uh, what? Sure glad he's telling jokes about his dick now. <laughs> you just think about it. Next time you get on a plane, you know, just picture my fat drunk ass looking at you from under the wing. Just... <sighs> Hell, it looks all right. Let it go. That's why I think we're good. 
I used to teach nuclear safety seminars. I can't even say the words right, you know. <laughs> And I taught those classes all across the country. And my favorite ever is I was teaching up in Boston one time, and they were really struggling. <laughs> and I'll give you an example. Because what I learned when I was teaching those classes is that when you sound like me, you can end every sentence with the paragraph and shit and get away with it every time. <laughs> Nobody will question it. I'll give you an example. I was up from my class. Go, you know, class. A 37 rank and full body exposure to gamma radiation a lot of times causes decomposure in the perineum cells and sometimes this can lead to abnormal replication of white blood cells which leads us to believe that the threshold effects of gamma radiation can cause leukemia and shit. <laughs> Who's arguing with me, right? I got the slow kids in the back. Is that shit two words, Mr. Jerry? <laughs> yes, it is, Billy. Write that shit down. It will be on the test. So if y'all figured out I ain't from here. Not anywhere around here. <laughs> I, was, I was raised by hillbillies, bless them. Uh, and my family's just crazy. Like, family's a weird thing. You know, let's just, we can talk about some real shit. Because everything in your life that you've learned not to do again, every mistake you've made, has created a bad little memory. Let me tell you, I went water skiing. Okay? 22 years ago on Toledo Bend, I went water skiing. I fell off water skis at 30 miles an hour. Water went up my butthole and out of my nose. <laughs> I ain't never forgot that, <laughs> right? My friends called me up there. Hey, you want to go water skiing? Why don't you go to hell? I, I ain't. <laughs> but with family stuff, we put all these people in the same room that don't even like each other, and we make some of them sit at a little kid's table, and we expect everything to go okay. <laughs> and it's like we don't remember. My dad calls me, hey, whole family's getting together. You want to come up and visit? Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> oh. No. Like my uncle, one of my favorite uncles is my mom's younger brother, my uncle Bobby. And my uncle Bobby is a functional alcoholic, okay? <clears throat> He's very good at it. <laughs> he goes to work at 1030 because he has to wait for the liquor store to open. <laughs> this is his life. He's good at it. He's also the guy that likes to use words that he don't necessarily know how to pronounce or even know what the hell they mean, you know? Like he just likes to hear himself say the shit because he thinks it makes him sound smart. This guy, if he eats too much cheese, he gets compensated. <laughs> you get money, that's some good ass cheese, you know? <laughs> He's crazy, man. I was up there, I was visiting him and my aunt, and I was hanging out with them in the, uh, they were arguing, and I was hanging out with them in the, uh, the kitchenette part of the trailer. So, that ain't the joke. Boy, y'all got too good for me, quick. Act like y'all ain't seen some wood paneling and a stove at. He and my aunt were arguing about something, I don't know what, but she got fed up with it at some point. She said, if I wanted your opinion, I'd give it to you, right? Well, that's. That's battle on. <laughs> got to be tricky with alcoholics when you say those kind of things. <laughs> Boy, my uncle got mad as hell, right? He jumped out of his chair and he goes, oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Well, touch A, Rhonda. Touch A. <laughs> oh, I know what it means. I, don't, my, I had the same reaction. I was like, what the hell is touch A? And then he got mad at me. He did, because I believe it's Latin for you got me, dumbass. Oh. <laughs> Swing and a miss. <laughs> Maybe you should have got that English degree from Pahenix Online University. That was a... <laughs> Crazy. I got my little 
one of my little cousins, Tina, she has a kid named CJ. CJ's that kid in the family that's got something wrong with him, but nobody else will say anything about it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? She just pretends like he's fine and everybody else just goes along with it, but they're all... <laughs> At the same time, my Uncle Donnie had Alzheimer's disease, which we're not even sure he got diagnosed. But that was his excuse for being able to say whatever the hell he wanted at any given time, you know? I'll never forget we were all hanging out. It was like during Easter, and CJ's sitting on the couch, and he's hitting himself in the head with a plastic hammer. <laughs> and his mama's sitting there with this stupid grin on her face, like, that's just what all 16 year olds do. <laughs> And nobody will say anything, you know what I mean? But not Uncle Donnie. Uncle Donnie walked right in the house. Tina, I think there's something wrong with that boy of yours. He got one wheel of his tricycle stuck in the grass or something. There's something wrong with him. No, Alzheimer's. We were worried we might not get together for a while, so they decided to let Uncle Donnie do the prayer before we ate, which he rambled on for 20 minutes about shit I know ain't in the Bible, you know? I heard something about a volcano and a crackhead. And I was like, are you talking about Lords of the Rings? Can I just have my damn turkey? And then I had to sit at the little kid's table because you ain't supposed to say damn when somebody's praying. <laughs> yeah, they're all crazy. Yeah. My, mama's my, my mama's my favorite hillbilly of all of them. Uh, she's amazing. She... Uh, My mom was queen of the mom burn. Y'all know what the y'all don't know what the mom burn is. The mom burn is if you're a mama, you do. It's the most passive aggressive, <laughs> guilty burn that exists. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, mama can put that guilt on you better than anybody. Mama can make you feel terrible about just being terrible. You know, <laughs> my mom. My, one of my favorite ones, and it was like one of these like. My mom would get you so good, you didn't realize it until you were an adult. You're just like, whoa, is my nose bleeding? What happened? <laughs> and she was letting me off at the junior high one day. I went to uh, Albright Middle School right there in A Leaf, Texas. And she was dropping me off at the junior high one day. And I went to get out of the car. And she drove off and ran over my foot. <laughs> yeah, and this ain't these little, this ain't these little compact cars y'all drive now, right? This is a 1973 Chrysler Cordoba, okay? <laughs> Weighed about 27,000 pounds. I hit the ground, bawling, squalling, crying. My mama jumped out of that car mortified as hell. Anybody seen that? Grabbed me, towed me back in that car. She pulls out of the school parking lot, and I'm over there bawling and sobbing in the passenger seat. And I, I'll, I will never forget this ever in my life, but she looked over at me and she patted my head and she said, baby, I'm gonna take you to the hospital. I'm so sorry you didn't get out of the way in time. I was okay with that till I told my wife that story when I was like 35 years old and she was like, oh my God. And I was like, oh. She got me. <laughs> my mom was my biggest fan and uh, definitely my toughest critic. And then she died on me. And uh, left me lost as a human being because she was my best friend. And she died of uh, she died of liver failure, which is a it's a really ugly ugly way to watch somebody you love go, because it causes a lot of problems. It causes uh, psychosis, and it causes memory failure, and her skin turned yellow. And one of the last times that I saw her alive, she was in a rehab hospital in Sugarland, Texas. And I, like a lot of you. I was a working stiff. I was working on construction projects 10 hours a day 
and I had my own family, and then I was living in Conroe, and I was driving two hours to Sugar Land to try to visit with her every night, and I had gone down to visit her that night, and I was trying to feed her because if you could get her to eat, her ammonia levels would come back down to normal, and she'd be normal a little bit. And I'd been there about 20 minutes trying to get her to eat, and I was frustrated, and I was stressed out with my own problems, and I was watching my mom go through this thing, and she kept calling me Chad. And uh, finally, after you know a few more minutes of it, I couldn't take it anymore, and I was like, Mom, who the hell is Chad? And she looked up at me, And in a very rare moment of lucidity, she was herself again, and she was there. And I know she was there because my whole life she called me Jaybird. And uh, she looked up at me and she said, Jaybird, I'm so sorry about all this. I really am. But when I was pregnant with you, I really, really wanted to name you Chad. She said, I did. I want to name you Chad. And your dad come running in the emergency room at the last minute and begged me to name you after him. And I was, I'm not going to lie, I was shaken to my core, sharing this profound truth with me and my mother. And I had all these things running through my mind and all these questions and all these things I wanted to ask her. But what come out was, Jesus Christ, Mom! Chad probably went to fucking college! <laughs> a Roth IRA and a 401k and a new Silverado and I don't even know what two of them goddamn things are but I know I'm supposed to have one by now <laughs> and my mama quick and witty as ever looked right back up at me from her deathbed she said well I know one thing Chad wouldn't have said the F word to his mama <laughs> Touch A, mama. <laughs> Touch A. She was an amazing lady. Uh, she's a lot of the reason I'm here tonight. Um, I do have this wonderful little memorial tattoo on my hand, and uh, I love it, and it's one of my favorite things, but I implore you that if you decide to get a memorial tattoo, especially of your mother, to do a very thorough audit of all the jobs that body part does. <laughs> There's been more than a handful of awkward moments, if you... Like, I, I come from hillbillies, okay? Like, my mom's funeral was lit, right? Like, I come... <laughs> my dad was so mad that my mom's younger sister showed up stoned to the funeral, and I didn't have the heart to tell him I was stoned out of my gourd. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's bad enough I was sitting there, and my sister went up before me to do her eulogy, and she stole half of my eulogy, and I'm back there in the seat grabbing my wife's hand like, she stole my act! She just stole my act. I got a gold stage in five minutes and she just stole my act. And Rachel's like, this is not a show. I'm like, we all know what I do, okay? I got three applause breaks in my mama's eulogy, all right? Let's just, that's the way she'd have wanted it. <laughs> one of her sister, one of her sisters, her older sister showed up to her funeral drunk and uh, I, got, I got no issue with that. Grieve how you need to grieve, baby. Right? But she also had a Route 44 Sonic cup full of bourbon and ice. I got to grieve how you want, but have some fucking decorum. You know what I mean? Like, leave the Sonic cup in the truck. And you could smell it. You know what I mean? I was, I was one row and six seats away, and I was like, okay, Barbara Jean, we know that is not cherry limeade. Okay? <laughs> There is a sound that liquor and ice and styrofoam makes, and it's not a funeral sound. (laughs) 
My dad's very religious. My dad's very Pentecostal. In fact, I was, uh, when me and my wife first met, I was terrified to have children because half of my family are strict fundamentalist Pentecostals and the other half are strict fundamentalist alcoholics. <laughs> it's not a great mix. I was terrified that my sperm were just down there like, we got the Holy Ghost down in our soul, just like the Bible says. <laughs> you don't have to call me darling. <laughs> My dad's very religious, man. He, uh, we like to work on cars together a lot when I was growing up, or I should rephrase that. I like to hold a flashlight poorly and get cussed at a lot growing up. <laughs> Some of y'all had that job too, I see, yeah. Stop shining my damn eyes, what is wrong with you? I don't know, maybe let me hold a wrench or something, I don't know. We always liked them reality mechanic TV shows, you know. We wanted to have one, but ours would be called, oh shit, we gotta take that back off. <laughs> he had all those dad sayings, you know? They're like, those East Texas dad sayings. Like, hey boy, you're cruising for a bruising. Y'all heard that? And, uh, yeah. One time he told me, he's like, boy, you skating on thin ice. I was like, dad, we live in Texas. There ain't no, I'm sorry, daddy. I, <laughs> He told me, my, my favorite one that he ever got me with, though, was he told me one day, he said, I was really screwing up. I was about 17 years old. And he goes, you know what your problem is, boy? I was like, no, but I bet Chad does. <laughs> Chad probably knew what the problem was. Jerry Wayne, not so much. He said, you know what your damn problem is? Is you're full of the L.A., the D.A., and the S.A., I was like, Daddy, I don't know what that means. He said, the lazy ass, the dumb ass, and the smart ass. And I thought about it for a minute. And I was like, well, Daddy, I can't be a dumb ass and a smart ass. And say, That's just what the hell I'm talking about <laughs> right there. You just always got an answer, don't you? <laughs> he took us to church a lot. Me and my younger sister, I... Uh, and I didn't go, I, I mean, I went to a Pentecostal church, like not, not like this, not this touchy, feel good, Joel Osteen bullshit that's going on now. Not like that. I went to the scary, you know, like fire and rain will rain down from the little baby's eyes and, you know, scary fire and brimstone preaching, you know, with those Pentecostal preachers that all go to Lufkin, Texas, learn how to stomp their leg just like that. <laughs> that's that move. They always got that little handkerchief. Come and wipe that face down, you know. I want to do this for y'all, but I got to put myself back in that place. I, uh... It's that leg, man. You, got... you got to get the cadence of that leg just right, or the whole thing feels off. We was in church. I remember it was a Sunday night. And we was in church, and me and my sister was sitting there with my daddy in the pew. And it had broke out in revival that night. Spoiler alert, every Sunday night at the Pentecost church breaks out in revival. <laughs> and that old preacher we had was winding down. He had done wiped his face. And I'll never, he was back there at his podium. And grabbed a hold of that mic. Brothers and sisters, I seen you stream in here tonight. I see pain. I see heartbreak. I see struggle on your faces tonight. I see the pull of the secular world that's pulling you back tonight. <laughs> and what I want y'all to know tonight, brothers and sisters, what I need you to know is that we serve a right on time God. 
We serve a fighting God. And I want you to take all those things causing you pain, causing you struggle, and causing you heartbreak. And I want you to take all those things and I want you to bring them down to the altar tonight for God to deal with tonight. I want you to take everything that hurts you and I want you to leave it on the battlefield for God to deal with. I want you to stand like David before Goliath on trembling legs. <laughs> and bring them issues to the Lord. And my dad got all choked up and big tear in his eye. I never seen him cry. And he grabbed me and my sister by the arm. And he took us to that altar. And I ain't seen him since, you know? <laughs> Depending on how tonight goes, I'll be celebrating 14 years of marriage this year. <laughs> Thank you. And I married an amazing lady. Uh, way above my pay grade. Uh, I tell you, I have been a chubby guy my whole life, so I knew how to talk to girls. You had to learn when you're chubby really early on. You know, like most guys in pretty good shape, they're selling a Camaro or a Mustang. I've been selling a four-door Chrysler for 30 years. I'm real good at it. I know it's bigger and harder to park, but it's a much more comfortable ride. Got a little more horsepower. I always remember the night I met her, but I don't remember it the way she does because she was the first woman I ever had problem talking to. I was always good at talking to girls, and the night I met her, I was so struck by this human being that I couldn't talk to him. But I really, you know, I was a very silent, cool enigma. I just sat over there and drank my drink and gave her the look, you know. But when she tells the story, the look looks like this. She may be exaggerating. She's a wonderful lady. She, uh, she had dad issues when I met her, not daddy issues. That's different. Daddy issues are when you're crazy and good at sex. Uh, no, she's excellent at sex, but it has nothing to do with her father. But her, her dad was amazing. You know what I mean? Like, he was literally this man that, he, he was a fucking cowboy. He rode bulls and stuff. He was a real-life cowboy, and he could do anything. He could fix anything. He knew about everything, everything. Like, I could go through all the training to become an astronaut. Use your imagination there. <laughs> and let's just say I'm ready to go on my first space flight. I guarantee you about five seconds before liftoff, I'd get a phone call from him. And he'd be like, look, fella, he always called me fella. He'd be like, look, fella, uh, before you go into space, you need to know it's really hard to wash your hair up there and make sure you take plenty of tang. We use tang in my day. <laughs> it's how cool this dude was. When me and my wife first met and we were living in sin and just boning, right? <laughs> I don't know what you young kids call it. That's what we was doing. You know, it's that honeymoon period where just every day smells like vagina. It's great. And you're just doing it all the time. And one night we got a little too rough. She broke my penis. Did you know that an uh, improper dismount can cause a broke penis? That's a real thing. It's like I, at one point I had this sturdy, curvy thing, and then it was a speed square, and it was pointing that way. It was really bad. Hurt a lot. I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't even know what kind of doctor to go to. And she's like, well, you need to see a urologist. And all of a sudden, from the other room, her father, who hadn't heard the whole conversation, says, oh, I know a urologist I've been going to for 20 years over at Forest. I'll give you a ride, fella. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't ride in the truck of this cowboy that I just broke my penis having sex with his unwed daughter. I can't do that. 
you know, I'm Christian, all right? I, got, I know there's rules. <laughs> and he was insistent. That's how nice a guy he is. He's like, no, no, man. You ride that motorcycle, it's going to be too hard on you. I'll take you to urologist. He's a great urologist. You're going to love him. And we're like walking out the door, and I'm looking at my wife like, this is just, we're just letting this happen? This is what's happening. Okay. <laughs> Fine. And I got in that truck, and we ride to the urologist. And I'm petrified. I'm like, oh, my God, how am I going to explain this? I hope I don't need surgery. It's going to be hard to hide. Broke penis surgery, you know? <laughs> and I go back to the doctor's office. He's really cool. He says it happens all the time. You don't have to have surgery. You just got to have to take this medicine. And he gives me this medicine. And I'm like, whew, Scott Free made it out, right? Now all I got to do is go home and take my broke penis medicine. <laughs> Nobody will be the wiser. And I walk out into that waiting room where my father-in-law is patiently waiting on me and I got my broke penis medicine and I'm already cooking up the lie to tell him. And the doctor walks out, sees him, forgets who he is and decides he must be my father and gives him the good old boy treatment. <laughs> boy, that boy's just got to take a break every now and then. I don't know who this hot little ticket he's dating is, but he can't just beat it up every night. He can't just beat it to death every time he touches it. He's just got to take a little break from the gal. My father-in-law's not blinking at this point. And I got to get in the truck with this dude. And we're like riding down. It's the quietest truck ride ever, right? I can hear rockers ticking in the engine. <laughs> And I'm just like looking for landmarks, making sure we're going home and not to the ship channel or nothing, you know, like. I mean, he's a cowboy. He's got a knife in every compartment of his truck. And he's maybe also an astronaut. I don't know. He does a lot of stuff. And we get to the house and this is how cool he is. He never says another word about it ever, 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 ever. I am not that cool. <laughs> Touch my kid, somebody's dying. I'm not that cool. He never says a word about it. And a few months later, when me and her got our first house, and we were like having to fix it up, it was a junky old house, and I was bartending at night at the comedy club, and then during the day, me and him were working on the house, and I was, you know, I was falling asleep, I was tired, fatigued. I had my first Adderall experience with him. I don't know why he had But he looked at me, he goes, hey fella, you look a little tired there. This here's called an Adderall. Just take half and it'll give you a little juice to keep you going. And he walked away and I was like, half. <laughs> Do I look like a half kind of guy? <laughs> half. That's not how I operate, homie. And I took the whole thing. And then I started working on a kitchen drawer. And this kitchen drawer wouldn't line up right with the cabinets in the house. And I kept working on this kitchen drawer for like six hours until I made myself late for work. <laughs> and I jumped on my bike and I ran to work real quick. But then even when I got to work, all I could think about was the kitchen drawer. I was getting the bar ready, kitchen drawer. You want a whiskey sour? Kitchen drawer! Jack on the rocks, kitchen drawer! All I could think about was this kitchen drawer and how to fix this kitchen drawer. And my boss come in, he's like, why are you so distracted? And I was like, fuck you, kitchen drawer! I quit. And I was so happy, because I was like, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna fix the kitchen drawer. And I was riding my motorcycle home and I was like, a kitchen drawer! And I get into the driveway and I get off the motorcycle and I walk into the house and my father-in-law fixed the fucking kitchen drawer. <laughs> and I was awake for a while after that, <laughs> thinking really bad shit about him until I remembered I broke my penis having sex with his daughter. Even. She's amazing, uh, really amazing. She says things, you know, 14 years, it, you know, she says things to me that are not love talk sometimes, you know. 
Like the other day, we were talking about some, oh, I was telling her I like red grapes better than green grapes. And she goes, yes, you're sometimes averse to green foods. <laughs> that's not love talk, that's science. <laughs> She's studying me. And I'm terrified she's doing this Jane Goodall thing where she's going to come out with a documentary in 20 years and be like, I lived among them for 20 years, and this is what I know. <laughs> and we've been, it's been a good 14 years. I'm, a, I'm an amazing, lucky guy. I know I've told you all that before. She's honestly my best friend in the world. It doesn't mean that you don't still have arguments and shit. I mean, some of you have been married, been together a long time. You know, you fuss, you know. We, we fuss sometimes because uh, one of the problems we have is uh, she likes to communicate with me in signs. And historically, guess what I haven't got? <laughs> Fucking signs. I don't, you know, we're visual. Just paint me a picture. Tell me what you need me to do. But that's not what happens. And we were having an argument recently, and I was like, you know what your damn problem is? Don't that sound familiar? Chad wouldn't have said that. <laughs> Your problem is you don't ever instigate sex. And she looked at me like I was crazy. She looked at me like my head fell off because I'm not usually so bold, you know? And she, she goes, what are you talking about? She said, the other night we were sitting on the couch watching that movie and I was rubbing your arm. Did y'all know that was a sign? I didn't know it was a goddamn sign. Did y'all know it was a sign? I didn't know. I pulled my damn phone out. Pulled my calculator out, tried to calculate how much pussy I missed out on in 14 years. Because I didn't know the sign. I was like, carry the one, that's a lot. I, I'm not happy about this. I made myself a note right there in my little notepad on my phone. If she rubs your arm, it's on. <laughs> Boy, just a few weeks later, I was in the kitchen like I do. <laughs> she came up behind me and she real seductively like stroked me on the elbow. And I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> she gave me the sign, right? I turned around and started trying to get her britches off. She's like, what the hell are you doing? You gave me the sign. She goes, no, you Neanderthal. I was just trying to show you some affection. Guess I need a new note. The sign does not work in the kitchen. Well, after about six weeks, I got a whole list of places the sign don't work now. <laughs> sign don't work at the park. S sign don't work at her mama's house. Sign don't work at the bank. That one pissed her off. We did not get our PPP loan. I'm lucky. I, we got two kids. Uh, Mainly because I took sex ed from a Mormon. <laughs> they taught me some lies. And they're good kids. They're really good kids. But like for the first one, we like planned and planned and planned and practiced and practiced and practiced. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, that's my oldest. And they came along and they're amazing. And it was just the sweetest time in my life. They, they never cried. They never fussed. They were just this amazing baby. They slept 10 hours through the night, every night straight home from the hospital. It was a magical time. And then like two years after that, my wife surprised me after work with a stick she peed on. <laughs> I don't know why she got all like, you know, CSI about it. I'd have believed her. She got an honest face, you know, she's a good gal. And I, free, I went into dad mode. I was like, oh, cool, cool. Well, great, because now I just need two of everything I ain't got. <laughs> and then I felt terrible because I looked over at her, and she was panicking. She was freaking out, too. 
And, you know, I, we make jokes and stuff, but she really is my best friend in the world. And, you know, I'm supposed to be her shoulder. I'm supposed to be her rock, you know. She's supposed to be able to lean on me in sickness and health and all that crap we said in that church at time. I'm supposed to be doing that. <laughs> and I looked at her, and I, I, I just racked my brain for anything to say to make this person I love feel better about this situation and I said one of the dumbest things I've ever said in my life because I looked at her and I said, baby, 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 it's okay. Because the one thing you and me know is we make good babies. And the Lord heard me. And he said, I got your number, Jerry Wayne. Because nine months later, this little dude showed up. I want to preface this with saying I love my son. <laughs> He's wonderful. But I don't know how you take the same genetic ingredients and mix it up and get something so damn different. Like, I don't know how that works, right? Like, I like to cook. It's like if I mixed up all the shit to make a chocolate cake and put it in the oven and waited the desired amount of time and opened the oven and it was a pickle. That's what happened to my life <laughs> with this kid. I don't know how, I didn't change nothing up. I got one move, I'm real good at it. That's what I brought to the table. It must be her fault. <laughs> He's, I don't understand, man. I have had to say shit to this kid that I've never had to say to another human being. Son, please don't put your penis on the dog. She doesn't enjoy it. I got a Jack Russell scratching out hashtag me too in the sand behind the house. We got problems. He, did, he, got, he got me with this one a while back. Uh, uh, we and her would be like, I take it. <laughs> we, were, we were sitting on the couch, right? Hanging out watching Netflix, there was no arm rubbing, normal night. <laughs> and he comes running in, eight years old, and he pulls his shirt up and yanks his pants down and pulls his little penis out and goes, would you like some tea and biscuits? <laughs> I didn't know what to do with that. I'm dad, I can't laugh at it, but I damn near had a stroke trying not to. I thought I was getting Bell's palsy. My eyes started twitching and shit. And I blame it on the school, but he's homeschooled. They are. My oldest, that's my rocket scientist. They're a genius. Uh, they, uh, they're the ones that hit me. They're, they're possibly the smartest person I know besides my wife. And I told you I was raised by hillbillies. And they hit me with the questions that I don't have answers for and I'm not ready for. You know, uh, and I'll give you an example. I was sitting at the kitchen. I was in the kitchen. I was cooking and I was listening to the radio and my oldest, uh, they have taken computer coding classes since they were seven years old. You know what I had down when I was seven? Not crapping my britches. <laughs> and I ain't gonna lie to you, Houston, say I was a hundred percent on that all the time. <laughs> But this kid writes video games and crap. They're a genius, you know? And they hit me with these questions. I was in the kitchen, and I was cooking, and I was listening to the radio, and Junie looked at me, and they said, Dad, what's a homosexual? <sighs> this does not feel like a meat question. I didn't know what to do. I was raised by Hillbilly. I got terrible information on this subject. And I looked in the room for my wife, and she wasn't there. And I'm like, we need a buddy system. You can't just leave and leave me here answering stuff like this. And at this point, I realized my oldest is still there looking for an answer. And I was like, all right, well, let's let Hillbilly Dad take a stab at this. How bad could this go? I was like, look, baby. Sometimes... When two boys really, really love each other. And she goes like, you and Uncle Joey? What? Hell no. Hell no. Hell no. 
try again. All I mean is like sometimes when two people the same gender, what's gender, daddy? Oh my God, I don't have an answer for that one either. You know, some people think it's biology. Some people think it's a social construct. All I know is I keep getting called a cis male. And she's like, because you got a sister? Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> and at this point, I realized my kid is very confused. And I was like, baby, baby, where did you hear that word? And they said, a while ago, daddy, the man on the radio said that Palais Royals having doorbuster deals on homosexuals all weekend long. And my wife walks through the room for two seconds. And she goes, that's home essentials. That's towels and shit. Where have you been? <laughs> the boy hits me in them hard ones. He got me real good a while back. Uh, he came into the house at some point, he's eight years old, and told me his favorite song was a Rascal Flat song, and I about had a heart attack. I was like, not my damn house. <laughs> no, 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 this house Willie Nelson, Johnny Cash built, no. I don't reckon we're gonna be doing that. Nope, nope, nope. I immediately turned into my father, that's what happened. I was like, no, help, no, no. I was digging through the Bible for reasons he couldn't do it. Like, here we go. Here we go, right here. Ecclesiastes 7, 5. It's better to hear the rebuke of a wise man than the song of a fool. Right there, Jesus said it. No rascal flats, not my damn house. <laughs> then I went and got a vasectomy. <laughs> I'm 44. I don't need no more surprises, okay? And I was scared to get one for a long time because I was afraid if I got the vasectomy, I wouldn't be able to come, you know, because I didn't... I'm no scientist, okay? <laughs> but I am somewhat of a plumber. <laughs> and I know what happens when you cut a line. Stuff stops coming out of it. So I was worried that when me and my wife got to our magical, intimate moment, he was just going to have the dry heaves and just be like, hur, 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 hur. That's not sexy. tell you guys one more thing about uh, them kids they uh they they do they do make me strive to be better you know we're all supposed to do better than the generation that raised us that's that's the job right it's not none of this oh it's good enough for me it's good enough for them i don't believe in that i believe i wrote the check to get them here and i owe them the rest of my life that they're on my bill and i brought them here and if they ever need a safety net if they ever need somebody just to love them they got daddy that's what that's my job right <laughs> Yeah. And after that question from my daughter, I felt really, oh, they were my daughter at the time, they're non-binary now, but I felt really, I'm trying to keep it right because I don't want to disrespect them, and, uh, but I felt really bad about the situation, you know, and I, did, I was like, I want to know more and I want to be ready for whatever comes down the pipeline. I want to be ready for anything that comes down the pipeline. If one of my babies comes to me and is worried and says, Dad, I think I'm gay, I want to hug them and look them in the eye and say, you know what? I love you. Love whoever you need to love. Check. If one of my babies comes to me at some moment and says, Daddy, I think that I am trans, I want to hug them and look them in the eye and say, I love you no matter what. Be whoever you need to be. Check. When one of my babies comes to me and says, Dad, I think I'm non-binary, I wanted to hug them and look them in the eye and say, you know what? Daddy's not good at math either. Check. <laughs> hey guys, I'm Jerry Wayne Longmire. I 
love y'all so much. My mentor always told a crowd, he said, if you treat every comic the way you treat me, you'll never have a bad show. I love you. Thank you so much for coming out. Y'all have a good day.